Uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Harmer Burton, just suggested uh, that I should tell you that if you've been really depressed by the last three speakers, <laughs> we have one now who will tell you where to go if you're depressed. <laughs> So, uh, on that note, I'd like to introduce to you Jeremy Sapinski. He has an unusual capacity to translate highly complex matters in physics and astronomy into language that people like us can understand. The Schemmel Forum is grateful that he takes the time to do so, some of that translation for us. Today he will trans transport us into a world that is largely unknown to us, I bet that sounds good and prognosticate about what kind of life might be, might exist out there, and what relevance that has to our lives on the planet Earth. A native of Oliphant, Jeremy recently uh, received his bachelor's degree from Villanova and his PhD in physics and astronomy from North, Northwestern University. So please help me in welcoming him to the podium. All right, thank you, Sandra. And before I begin, uh, I want to take the few minutes to thank Sandra, Kim Fetzko, and everybody else who's been instrumental in putting this all together. So if we can just quickly thank all of them. <laughs> all of the speakers were really great. And, uh, and from Abraham Lincoln to Green, it's always good to have a good tie-in. Yes. <laughs> the jokes don't get any better. Uh, <laughs> So I wanted to thank all of the speakers beforehand. Everything was really interesting and wonderfully done. Uh, Matt offered to lower the bar for me, and I just have to say he didn't really do it well enough. Uh, <laughs> um, so between corruption and power, uh, and our weakening uh, power abroad, the fracturing of the American superpower, uh, projecting that, the creation of that superpower from the past into the future, and then an exploration of the human drive uh, from success, that, to success, that can kind of lead to corruption and infighting. Uh, I'd like to bring us all a little bit in a, in a different direction and say that if science fiction has taught me one thing, then, then it, there's one thing that can actually solidify and unify the entire world against something, or at least behind something, and that's invasion of an alien species. <laughs> So with that, I'd like to ask the question, are we alone? It's, in my opinion, a fundamental question that we as a humanity have been searching for and looking into since we first started being able to have thoughts. I'd like to think that the question of are we alone started when we were hunter-gatherers walking from hill to hill and region to region, wondering if over that next hill we're going to find another tribe. It wasn't necessarily a question or a quest with hopefulness. Oftentimes it might have been a question of fear, of worry, of scarcity of resources. And to some extent, we have a lot of those questions going on today. But now, at this point in our society, We've never been actually closer to answering that question on as grand of a scale as we can right now. Are we alone is something that we're no longer confining to the, our world, to the earth. We're now looking to answer that question in terms of are we alone in our solar system? Are we alone in our galaxy? Are we alone in the universe? With a Curiosity rover sitting on Mars doing tests about whether or not Mars may have been habitable, to our discovery of exoplanets on, around stars light years away from Earth, we're pushing the boundaries of that question to limits we've never seen before. So what I'd like to do is talk about that question, are we alone, in as much of a scientific context as we can. And to do that, I want to encapsulate that question by first starting with, where are we? to define what that boundaries might be. So this is a galaxy not dissimilar to our own. It's got wispy clouds and spiral arms. It's not our galaxy, of course, because we can't get far enough away from our own galaxy to take a good picture of it, as anyone who's tried to take a picture at a family reunion might understand. <laughs> So we have to, in order to ask that question, are we alone, we want to put ourselves here. 
We're in our galaxy about three quarters away from the center, which contains a black hole that's probably millions of times the mass of our own sun. That galaxy stretches 100 light years from end to end. And we are sitting out here on one star among billions, three quarters of the way out from the edge. But we didn't always know that. That wasn't something that was a fundamental, you know, we weren't born with that knowledge. It was a scant few hundred years ago when our picture of the universe looked like this. The Earth, big, sitting pretty right in the center. At that time, it was more centered around Europe and the Middle East, as opposed to pictures of the world now that have America large and proud. But back then, the Earth was at the center, and all of the planets and the sun and all of the stars and the constellations sat and floated around the edge. This was 400 years ago, not that long in an evolutionary sense, not even that long from a history of humanity. And of course, I mean, this makes sense for any of us who've gone outside, looked up at the stars. The sun, the moon, the planets, the stars, they all move around us. That's our perception. That's what it looks like. So why wouldn't this be what is reality out there? And it took a lot of people, a lot of staring at those stars and watching things move around to take the detailed observations enough and connect the ideas of Nicholas Copernicus with the data and the observations of Johannes Kepler and the theoretical models of Isaac Newton to bring all of our perspective into one that fundamentally changed the idea of ourselves in the universe. It took us from a position of preeminence, of dominance, of everything revolved around us to one where the sun, not the earth, is at the center of our solar system. Now, from a picture point of view, this doesn't look all that different. We've translated the sun, or the earth at the center for a sun on the outside, and we've just kind of switched those two perspectives. But ideologically, this was huge. The heliocentric revolution changed the idea of scientific thought to one where the humanity was not necessarily at the center of creation. It pushed the sun there. Now, to be fair, a few hundred years ago, we were still, well, that's the sun, and the sun is now the center of creation. It may not be us, but at the very least, it's the sun. The geocentric model, where Earth was at the center, lasted for 1,500 years. And it was only four, 400 years ago or so that this model started to become what was thought. But this wasn't the end of it. There was still more of it to come. This is a picture uh, from the Hubble Space Telescope, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. This is a recent picture. It was not taken very, very long ago at all. Every single point of light in this picture is a galaxy. It's not a star. It's an entire galaxy filled with billions of stars. This is our current picture of what the universe is. We're using the Hubble Space Telescope to probe the farthest reaches of the universe itself. And in fact, it was only about 100 years ago, less than 100 years ago, this wasn't our picture at all. We were still sitting at this idea of the sun being somewhat centrist. When Einstein was developing his theory of relativity, even after the theory of relativity was published, we did not understand that this to be the center of our universe. We, or we did not understand that this was what our universe entailed. That was the extent of it. We didn't have that in our mind. It was Edwin Hubble in the 1920s with the discovery and the data that confirmed that the universe was expanding. And that allowed us to really get the perspective that said that our solar system may not have any special place within the grand picture. And it's no coincidence that the telescope that's pushing the boundaries of the discovery of the edge of the universe bears Hubble's name. The telescope that's allowing us to use Einstein's relativity to probe the very, very beginning of time itself. So it's with that context of the size and the extent of where we are as a people 
that we can start to ask that question. If we kind of know where we are, and we now see this universe, of which we are one planet of eight or nine, around one star, which is among hundreds of billions in our galaxy, among billions of galaxies in the universe, where's everyone else? Okay? And that kind of further pushes that idea of, are we alone? And it's, how far can we look? Well, we're pretty good so far at finding galaxies, because galaxies are big. At least we can see the one that we're in, though it took us quite a while to even see that one. Once we realized what we are, we could start looking for these other galaxies, and galaxies are big. We can find those. Stars. Stars are close, and they're bright. We can find stars. But up until not too long ago, 20 years ago, the planets, the only planets that we knew, were around our own star. So planets were hard up until recently. This is a picture of a star in the constellation Pegasus. Astronomers call it 51 Pegasi. It's just easier to name things with numbers when you're looking at so many stars and so many uh, different constellations in the sky. This star is a sun-like star. It's very similar to our sun, about the same size, about the same mass, about the same brightness. And it's because of that that we tend to gravitate to stars like this in such a way that makes us wonder, if we're here, what's there? And the question of what's there got this kind of extra resurgence and excitement when they noticed that this star wobbles. And what does it mean for a star to wobble? Well, astronomers have been looking at wobbling stars for a lot. In this case, it meant that the star moved towards us at about 70 meters per second, slowed down, stopped, and then moved away, and then repeated that over and over and over again. Astronomers have seen that before. We're used to this. It's a signature that something else is out there, some mass that's causing this star to move just like Earth causes the moon to orbit around it. Something was causing 51 Pegasi to move. Not really a big revelation. About 50% of the stars out there that you see in the night sky have something orbiting them. Usually it's another star causing it to wobble back and forth. But in this case, when they crunched the numbers to figure out what it was that was wobbling, they were a little intrigued. The thing that was making the star wobble was about the mass of Jupiter. Not only was it about the mass of Jupiter, but it appeared to orbit the star at a distance closer than that of our own planet Mercury to our sun. It was an object that we, if we put it around our sun, would call a planet. And it was huge, and it was orbiting closer to, Mer closer to our sun than Mercury is. Now, this was amazing. Who cares about whether or not it's Earth? Who cares about whether there's an alien blinking at us? We just found another planet. This was October of 1995. Less than 20 years ago, we found the first planet outside of our own solar system. This meant so much in terms of whether or not we're alone in the universe, because we now can say, well, there's at least one more planet out there. And if there's another Jupiter, is it possible that there can be another Earth? This opened the door for the maybe. And often in science, we're in a quest for that maybe. And I suppose in philosophy, and in political science, and in economics, and in everything else, the maybe is the key. We didn't find a no. So we want to look even harder. And to that end, I don't know how readable this is, to that end, NASA rewrote its scientific directorate. So the directives for NASA right now, this was stolen from the web. Working on it.
Can you hear me now? Yep. All right. So uh, NASA's science program seeks to answer the profound questions that touch us all. How and why are Earth's climate and the environment changing? How and why does the sun vary and affect Earth and the rest of the solar system? How do planets and life originate? How does the universe work and what are its origin and destiny? And are we alone? Two out of the five initiatives of the entire Mar uh, NASA Science Directorate asks about whether there is life in the universe. Where do we come from? Two out of five. That's a pretty hefty buy-in. I would have been happy with one, but we got two, and I'll take it, okay? So the question becomes, what is life? In order to find what, in order to know, are we alone? In order to decide whether or not we found life, it's really important to know what it is that we're looking for. We need to know what life is. So the first question that becomes is, what is life? And it turns out, a really, really difficult question to answer. Life's not easy. You can easily say, I know it when I see it. But that might work for you and I, but it really doesn't work when you have something under a microscope. You need some scientific definition that says exactly what life is. We'd have it really easy if a little green man walked into the room and said, take me to your leader. But that hasn't happened yet, so we need to come up with a contingency plan. Here's the problem, though. Life is a process. Life is not a thing. You and I are alive, but at some point we will no longer be alive. But the thing that is us, what's left behind for science to study, will not really have changed all that much. So while we are alive now, how do you distinguish the fine line between life and not life? And that becomes a very, very difficult question to answer. One that philosophers have been struggling with for a long time, and one that physicists find fairly simple. A physicist, Ir Erwin Schrodinger, has an excellent essay in 1944 that talks about this exact question. What is life? And he comes up with a really great definition, which says, life is something that seeks to maintain order within itself, which is great. And from a physics perspective, that's a great idea because it allows us to invoke equations that deal with entropy, negative entropy, and positive entropy, and how we interact with the environment. It allows us to say something about homeostasis and about how we as humans metabolize the universe and allow it to create some process within us. And that works fantastically when you're trying to write down an equation, but it doesn't exactly work on a living thing. If that alien were to walk through the door while we're but busy looking at our telescopes and our microscopes and trying to decide whether the order inside of that alien is increasing, decreasing, or staying the same, the alien's there scratching his head and saying, and your leader is where? Okay. <laughs> So if we just stick to that strict physics definition, it doesn't necessarily get us exactly where we want to go. If we were to look, say, at a picture of New York Times during uh, uh, New York in Times Square, any time during the year, would you say that that's something that order is being maintained? It's kind of difficult to even look at that definition in terms of us and our current civilization. So we need to look very specifically at biology. Unfortunately, biologists don't agree either. So there are a lot of things that we can use to define life. And there's a list that's commonly accepted as a bunch of things that should be true of something that is alive. So I'm going to go through these pretty quickly. So the idea is that any, any number of these might be violated, but most of them should be true. For example, homeostasis. Something that undergoes homeostasis should be internally self-regulatory. We keep our same body temperature, what we take in and what we take out maintains some sort of internal dynamic which is the way things are for us and maintains it that way. Inside of us we are organized. 
If we look at any number of us, there's a certain organization that defines where our heart is and where our lungs are and where certain pieces go. And that could be said for most of life. In general, life needs to metabolize. It needs to take in energy, and usually that entails excreting waste at some point as well. We grow. What is life usually starts off at some point and, and gains in size through its metabolism. It adapts as time evolves. Not necessarily a single uh, individual may or may not adapt, but oftentimes that would look at the entire species. We respond to things. If it fulfills all of these criteria and doesn't actually do anything, what does it mean to be alive? Particularly, does one need to pass on genetic material? What part of life does reproduction entail? But in, generally, in general, most of these things are what we would ascribe to processes that are alive. Things that are alive should have most of these. And it's intentionally vague. Well, let's take a look at some specifics. A rock. Rocks, I think we can all agree, probably not alive. They don't really undergo homeostasis. What happens on the inside of a rock and the outside of a rock don't really mesh. A rock is on the inside exactly what it stays. You heat it, it heats through. It doesn't maintain anything. Nor is it particularly ordered on the inside. It's just a big conglomerate of molecules. It doesn't metabolize anything, doesn't eat, doesn't excrete. Uh, some pet rocks, maybe, but... <laughs> Nor does it really grow. It stays the same size. It doesn't adapt to its environment. If you hit a rock with a baseball bat, it really doesn't care other than obeying the laws of physics. It doesn't really reproduce unless you hit it really hard with a baseball bat, and I'm not really sure that's reproduction either. But what about this rock? This is a crystal. It doesn't undergo homeostasis. Nothing actually uh, changes. When it doesn't internally self-regulate in any way. But if you take a look, at, pull out a microscope and look at the crystal structure, it's very organized. From ground to top, everything looks identical. It may not metabolize, doesn't eat anything, it doesn't excrete anything, but if you come back in a million years, it's probably gotten bigger. Okay? Crystals grow. They don't really adapt to their environment. They don't really respond to anything, but a crystal is a self-catalyst. So if I take a piece of this crystal and I put it somewhere else in the cave, it's going to start growing again, again, millions of years later. So it kind of asexually reproduces. Is a crystal alive? It's fulfilled a bunch of these. It's not an easy question. But then we get to things like trees. Trees certainly undergo homeostasis. They certainly metabolize things. And organization, we can see cells and structures. Okay? We can see leaves that have processes that we know how they relate to the rest of it. And it certainly grows from an acorn to a mighty oak. And over time, trees have certainly showed signs of adapting. But if you take a tree and you hit it with a baseball bat, it doesn't respond, at least not instantly. But if you, take a, if you put a tree in shade and have some sunlight nearby, it'll grow towards the light. So it responds just slowly. It reproduces, when, and you see all the helicopters that are going around and the acorns as well. So we have to make sure that we understand the time scales that are involved with life. <coughs> if we had no concept of trees and we were to see this and start talking to it, we might be willing to consider it as a rock. But how do you know? We can look at blood cells. Blood cells, as well as the rest of us, tend to be alive. There's very specific processes of homeostasis where they take in certain chemicals through the cell membrane. They're organized into organelles and certain structures within the cell that allow them to do something. They create energy. They don't really grow so much, but they certainly reproduce and respond to their environment. But living alongside of these cells, you're often likely to find one of these, a virus. 
Viruses are very, very interesting things that are often characterized as being on the cusp of life. They're clearly things that come around and infect us all, but they don't undergo homeostasis. They are very organized, though. They have this little capsule at the top that contains the DNA or RNA, depending on the type of virus. They have these feet that go and attach themselves to some other cells. But they have no metabolism. They do not eat, nor do they excrete, and they just kind of find their way through the body. They don't grow, but they do evolve and they adapt over time by the passage of genetic material. Their reproduction involves the destruction of another cell, but, but what that actual reproduction is is best described instead of reproducing as more of a self-assembling organic molecule. That's generally the way that viruses are described, a self-assembling organic molecule. They assemble just like crystals will assemble. But crystals don't inherit genetic traits, whereas viruses will. So I hope I've done my best at kind of muddying the waters as to what it means by life and what it is we might be willing to look for out there. And the fact that life is as muddy as it is means we need to figure out what it is that we want to look for. The definition of life is far from simple. So where do we start? The best thing to do, because we don't really have anywhere else to start, is to start where we are. Start with what we know. And if we want to look for the best cases for life that might be out there, let's start at the simplest cases of life that might be out there. We could start at bacteria. Okay? So your standard bacteria cell, single-celled organism, there are more there's probably more mass in single-celled organisms on the planet than there is any other life mass on the planet, put together. Okay? There are more there's more mass in bacteria, archaea, and um, prokaryotes, uh, eukaryotes, than there is all of the total rest of the biomass contained on the Earth. So we should probably look for something like this. It's, the ancestors of bacteria are likely the first things that ever evolved on the planet Earth. So, we need to, so what we would like to do is kind of look for the analogies to these bacteria. And if we want to start where we know, let's look at where bacteria live here on Earth. And from deciding where bacteria live here on Earth, we can kind of move on to find other environments that are similarly friendly to bacteria. And maybe that's a good place to answer the question, are we alone? So, most common bacterial strain on Earth, Staphylococcus aureus, or I'm not a biologist, so I'm guessing at that pronunciation. This is the most common bacteria out there, cause of staph infections, okay? It lives best at around 35 degrees Celsius in neutral water, not acidic, not basic. It lives, it works best in us, around us, in our kind of environment. So we're kind of thinking, well, maybe I should look for me. Similarly, the E. coli bacteria. It's common in soil, vegetation, and most common in our own intestine. Its ideal growth temperature is exactly where you might expect it if it was common in our intestines. But it's a little bit more tolerance to changes in pH. As acidic and basic environments, E. coli is fine. So it's good to start there and to kind of look at those bacteria that we might kind of encounter. And there are plenty of extreme environments on Earth. Deep down in the ocean, we would find things like hydrothermal vents, where the temperature gets up to 60 degrees Celsius, 140 degrees Fahrenheit, where we're subject to pressures many, many times atmospheric pressures, hundreds to thousands of miles below sea level. We would never expect to find life there because the most bo common bacteria, all the life that we see, is in and around the temperatures near us. And we would never expect to see life there until we did. This is a picture of something called a hyperthermophile. Not only are these single-celled organisms that can tolerate these kind of temperature extremes, but they're kind of organisms that prefer 
these kind of temperature extremes. They're the kind of bacteria, not all of them are bacteria, but that's a whole other story. They're the kind of organism that works best when the environment is something that many of us would hope would kill everything that we were trying to clean. Some of the strains of, of these hyperthermophiles have in a lab been tested and survived temperatures up to 121 degrees Celsius in superheated water. They can survive high acid contents and high doses of radioactivity if we wanted to cloud the uh, picture a little bit more. So we, can, we have hot environments, which might make sense because a large part of our Earth is hot. But there's no way we would ever find life in something as cold and arid as a desert in the middle of Antarctica, as far away from us as we can possibly imagine, where the temperatures drop down to negative 50, where it's dry and the sun doesn't shine for six months out of the year. We would never expect to find life there until we did. There are bacteria that tend to live under rocks, this green layer is a layer of bacteria that has been deemed a cryptoendolith. Endolith because they live between the rocks and crypto because it confused us. <laughs> we found these things deep in our, underneath, living in the rock in Antarctica. Similarly, they've been found in rock just about anywhere. Hot deserts, arid deserts, deep within, somewhat within any rock, not necessarily deep, sometimes just a few centimeters below the surface these bacteria or single-celled organisms can be found. This is a picture of what's called a chemolithoautotroph, which happens to be a kind of endolith, which was 1,200 meters below the ocean floor in the Indian Ocean. This thing eats rocks. Instead of photosynthesizing for its energy, it either di directly digests rocks or somehow secretes an acid to dissolve the rock which it can then use for its metabolitic processes that allow it to convert energy and survive. Okay? So we have creatures, single-celled organisms, living in some really strange places. We were hoping to narrow things down, but we kind of only opened the floodgates. So we can kind of take this picture back and say, there's a difference between finding single-celled organisms and finding life like you and I. So what about something bigger? Surely we're not finding fish living down there underneath these, uh, next to these hydrothermal vents until we found a worm. This is commonly known as the Pompeii worm because it happens to like those kind of really, really hot environments down by these hydrothermal vents. Now this isn't a single celled thing. This isn't a really, really, really big blown up picture. Well, on the screen it's really, really big and blown up. But this thing can get to sizes about five inches long. This is something that you would put in your hand and go ew and scream and run away. This is something that lives in these little tubules next to hydrothermal vents where its tail is deep inside with about 80 degrees Celsius, 176 degree Fahrenheit water where its head is out in the nice, balmy 22 degrees Celsius water outside of these uh, hydrothermal vents. It keeps its head out to breathe and to eat. And on the inside, so we're talking five inches, and the temperature drops by 60 degrees. It's got to be a really resilient creature to do that. And it turns out, it's kind of, it might be, in a very symbiotic relationship with some of these hyperthermophiles that have been found to coat its back. So these creatures, these single-celled organisms that love this kind of temperature, coat the backs of these and may, be, may provide some sort of um, environmental feedback loop, some sort of contribute to the ecology that allowed these Pompeii worms to live <laughs> and to survive. But surely something like this is very well adapted to the environment that it's living in. It's got to be able to cool its head off and, and for some reason it's got some, it, it likes to have this hot tail. So it's a very, very specifically, a, a creature that's specifically evolved for the niche that it's living in. Which brings us to the tardigrade, otherwise known as the water bear. This is a, a, a blown up picture of, of these little creatures. 
They range in size from about half a millimeter to one millimeter, a millimeter and a half. So these are very, very blown up. But these are creatures that have four segments, four sets of non-jointed legs. Subspecies of it have little ocular sensors that function almost like eyeballs. They're coated with little feelers that allow it to see what's going, to, to experience its environment. They're called tardigrades because they walk very slowly. And you can actually see one standing up there and it will move around, okay? So what about, why do I bring these up? Well, I bring them up because they're found everywhere. These little creatures live everywhere from the Himalayas to the deserts to the deepest parts of the sea and in your roof. I saw an article that said the easiest way to find one is to take a piece of moss and put it into some spring water. And you'll start seeing these things. They're visible to us. A millimeter, we can see that, okay? What's amazing about these is they, since they live everywhere, there are strains of these that live everywhere, we've taken some and we've frozen them to just about absolute zero brought them back, warmed them up, add a drop of water to rehydrate them, and they go on to live happy and productive lives. Heat them up to 150 degrees Celsius, somewhere around there is the current record, in this superheated water that's well above the boiling point of water. Briefly, if you, if you keep them there for just a short period of time and cool it back down, they'll go on to live happy and productive lives, reproduce and pass on their genes. This is kind of amazing. Expose them to a thousand times the radiation that we humans can withstand, and they go on like nothing happens. We've taken some, put them on a rocket, flown it out into space, left it there, exposed to space for 10 days, opened it up, completely exposed, not inside of the rocket, open up a container. Here, here is the vacuum of space. You're going to be exposed to pure solar radiation, not protected by the atmosphere, not, not subject to any of the filtering UV effects of the ozone layer, and 60% of them survived. Okay, ones that were exposed to pure, pure exposition to the space, even some survived that. Ones that the 60% is a little bit of minimal shielding uh, from ultraviolet radiation, and a lot of them survived. That kind of shielding might represent being housed inside of a rock or a meteor to foreshadow some things in the future. So these, these are creatures that can withstand just about anything that we can imagine throwing at them and still come away moving and walking and most importantly, reproducing. So the question becomes, why would these kind of things even exist? Why would the Earth, with such nice, lush greenery, even create and evolve such a weird creature that can withstand such harsh environments? And the reason is, the Earth wasn't always this nice. It wasn't always this pleasant. It didn't always like us all that much. Back about 500 million years after the initial formation of the solar system is a, a era of the creation of the Earth, which is called the, uh, the Hadean era, for obvious reasons, considering what the picture kind of makes it look like. This is the point when the Earth just finished forming and making itself somewhat spherical, but it's hot. It's getting pummeled constantly by meteors. It's nothing but a purely molten surface. And the entirety of the Earth was just this big ball of cooling molten lava. And that's where the Earth started. About four billion years ago, the Earth started to cool off. Some of the oldest rocks on the Earth, which represent the time when this lava first started cooling, date back to four billion years ago. That would be the start. That would be the time when life might have an ability to first set foot on something. And we find first remnants of what might have been alive at 3.9 billion years ago. In some places, we find this substance, which is called kerogen, which is thought to be some sort of leftover remnant of what might have been a photosynthetic bacterial process. That dates back to 3.9 billion years ago. 
in a hundred million years, in a geological blink of an eye, we went from being a molten, just starting to cool planet to something that may have had a thriving ecosystem that was able to create kerogen. And this is a picture of, uh, I actually, uh, actually gotten from an oil website that was looking at extracting oil from these kind of sands, oddly enough, okay? So we have this really, really rapid appearance of life. And instead of, instead of limiting, just by looking at life, instead of limiting our picture to try to help us decide where we, to, where we should look, the door has just been completely opened. Life can survive almost anywhere. It started almost as soon as it had the ability to hang on to something. So we need to help us in our search of just a little bit, which leads us to the question of what does life need? What's the absolute minimum thing that life might need to hang on, to exist, to be what it is? And that can be answered two words. It needs liquid and it needs energy. Both of those things are necessity for life. That doesn't mean that if I have both of these, then I have life. But if I don't have these, I will most likely, I notice I say most likely, never have life. So let's start with liquid. Why liquid? Well, the important thing about liquid is what this diagram tries to show. Anybody who's dropped a little bit of pepper in their glass of water knows that it's a little difficult to get that piece of pepper out because it'll float around, okay? You can see the effects of what physicists call Brownian motion. The stuff inside the liquid moves pretty rapidly as opposed to a solid which kind of sits there stable for the most part. So the reason that life needs liquid is because we need to be able to mix things. This is a simulation about, of solid diffusion. So if you can imagine a blue solid and a green solid with a dividing line in the middle, it takes a lot of time for the green line and the, re the green substance and the blue substance to actually mix and commingle. They will. It just takes a long time for a piece of blue to go from there to there. Whereas if you have a particle, a molecule in water, it moves around pretty darn quickly. Water will dissolve some crystals in the bottom of it and give you a nice mixture. So if you want to have biological processes, you want to take two things and ram them together to create a molecule that might help you out in your processes. And that's where water comes in handy. It really answers the question of how well can you mix things? I can't mix things and I can't have biological, cellular, or energy-based processes until I can actually effectively transport one substance from some place to another. Energy comes in because I need to be able to do something. It's the idea of metabolizing, of adapting, of responding, of growing, of being able to adapt to stimuli and possibly even to move. On Earth, most of our energy processes for most of the life on Earth is taken when we, is, uh, uh, the, this, the energy channel takes adenosine diphosphate, which is a very interesting molecule, puts it through some sort of concentration gradient. That'll, the, our cells will set up this concentration gradient of ions, which will allow us to uh, protonate the adenosine diphosphate and turn it into adenosine triphosphate. And why would we ever want to do that? Well, the idea is our cells can then take this ATP molecule and move it someplace else. And it could take it and it can move it from one place to another because we have the ability to move molecules, largely because we can diffuse things easier through liquid. And then we could take that molecule and we could break it and we can extract the stored energy later. So the processes of life often entail storing energy, moving energy, and then expending it somewhere else. So those two things put together are the absolute necessities for allowing us to create life. Or, well, not to necessarily to create life, but, but to find it and, and to allow it uh, and to know where it is that we can find it. So, where can we find it? 
Where can we get these two things together? Well, we know that it exists here on Earth. So instead of immediately jumping out to the beginning of time, at the beginning of the universe, let's start someplace close. Let's start at Mars. This is a picture of Mars. Not to be confused with a desert in Chile or Arizona. This is Mars. And if we could find life inside of a rock, inside of the Earth, that, in an environment that looks much less hospitable than this, can't we find it at Mars? That is why we have the Curiosity rover there. That is why we can see tracks from spirit and opportunity on the surface of Mars. Because when we know the diversity of life here on Earth, it's more of a question of why not than it is a question of why. So we want to be looking there and try to figure it out. And the reason often comes down to, for Mars, water. There's not a drop of liquid to be found on the surface of Mars. Nothing to help us enha enhance this ability to create energy and transport it anywhere else. But we found evidence that maybe, just maybe, there used to be water on Mars. And if there used to be liquid water on Mars, then everything else is there for life to exist. So the reason we're on Mars, generally, is not to find life. It's to hopefully find what used to be life. And the idea is maybe there's fossilized life on Mars. And maybe we can say that if on some other planet at some earlier part in the formation of the solar system, life may have existed there, it tells us that life is just as resilient elsewhere as it is here. And if life existed on Mars, we can move further out to a satellite of Jupiter, Europa. Europa, taking the, in this image taken from the Galileo spacecraft with the past on by it, is one of those kind of other objects on Earth that we need to really protect if we want to answer the question, are we alone? Or did we accidentally sprinkle some of our bacteria over there on Mars, or uh, on Europa? Because the surface of Europa is nothing but a sheet of ice. Not dry ice, water ice. Liquid water, well, not liquid ice, water ice. And beneath that ice is probably liquid water, a thick layer of liquid water covering the entirety of the moon. That's still liquid. It's not like it's frozen through and used to be. These cracks that you might be able to see that look like roads on the surface of this are new cracks in the ice where liquid water has bubbled to the surface. Liquid water that leaves these dark stains that probably represent some sort of hydrocarbon or dirt on the surface. That tells me that not only is there liquid water, but there's also other stuff that might be used to create energy. And if underneath this layer of water there is some sort of solid core, which our models of Europa tend to say that there is, could that mean we have hydrothermal vents deep underneath the ice and the ocean of water on Europa that evolved life independently from here on Earth? We don't know. And it's important to be able to answer these questions. But before we get to Europa, it's important to finish what we're looking for on Mars and see where we can stretch out next. Like a moon of Saturn, Titan. Now we're getting further out in the solar system. It's getting colder. Titan is very cold, but it's the only rocky body in the solar system, other than the Earth and Venus, to have a thick, thick atmosphere. It's the only moon known to have an atmosphere. Most of that atmosphere is nitrogen, just like most of the atmosphere here on Earth. The difference is Titan is so cold that there's no way water ice or even dry ice can survive anywhere in the atmosphere. But Titan is rife with organic molecules. The atmosphere of Titan has hydrocarbon clouds, methane clouds, that condense in the atmosphere. And those methane clouds that condense in the atmosphere, when the conditions are right, when they get hit by enough UV radiation from the sun, will actually rain liquid methane down onto the surface of Titan. 
This is a map of Titan taken by the Galileo spacecraft as it passed on by. The dark spots are oceans of methane. Couple of, usually no more than a couple of meters thick, but liquid methane. When we said liquid, we didn't say water. Water is very useful for us on Earth, and water is most likely the thing, and it's probably the best liquid out there for supporting and encouraging life that we know of. But then again, we never expected to find life in 80 degrees Celsius water either. So we, op we are open to the possibility that having liquid methane will allow some biological processes to go on. So even nearby, we have very big prospects to answer the question of, are we alone? But that doesn't give us really the meat of the question that we want. I mean, when we say, are we alone, are we going to be satisfied with bacteria someplace else? Usually not. We want to trade ideas and philosophies and talk about governments and, and the politics of some other alien life. <laughs> we want to talk about intelligent life. The universe is big. It's really, really big. And, and it's got billions of galaxies. And each of those billions of galaxies has billions and billions of stars. And of those billions of stars, there are probably billions of planets. Surely one of them should have intelligent life, somewhere out there. Whether or not it exists is all just a matter of probability. This is the Drake equation. It's the most common thing that people pull out when they're trying to talk about whether or not there's uh, li intelligent life in the universe. It has its merits and it has its drawbacks. But to give us a general order of magnitude estimate, it's actually fairly useful. In order, and, and it's actually pretty simple to understand, even though it's pretty long. So here's the one equation, and I'm putting it right way towards the end. So if I lose everybody on the one equation from a physicist's talk, it's OK to take a nap now. <laughs> so, so n represents the number of intelligent species in the Milky Way. And we could figure out the number of intelligent species in the Milky Way by starting with the number of stars that are in the Milky Way. If we take the number of stars that are in the Milky Way and multiply it by the fraction of those stars that actually has planets, Fp, and then of those planets, of those stars that have planets, we multiply by Ne, which is the number of those planets per star that might actually support life. So we take that number of planets, and then we multiply it by the fraction of those planets that might support life, where life actually evolves. Maybe it's a Mars, where it might, but doesn't have life. Okay? So FL, where life actually involves and, and evolves. And we're not content with just life at this point. We want FI, the number that are intelligent. What's the fraction of, of life out there that evolves to create intelligent life? And if we're really looking for these things, it's almost impossible for us to go and just see somebody looking back at us at a telescope. We need to find somebody who's yelling out, hey, we're here, like we've been doing ever since radio was invented. Okay? So we need the fraction of those systems that develop communication and that are interested in communicating outside of their own planet. But the Milky Way is old. Stars are old. We got here five billion years ago. Maybe we're a late comer, maybe we're an early comer. We need to multiply by the fraction of time that that civilization might be commu communicating, L, compared to the length, of the age of the galaxy. So we might, if we're lucky, we'll be around and communicating for as long as the dinosaurs were around for 100 million years. But if we're unlucky and we keep fighting with each other and bombing the crap out of each other, then maybe we're only going to be communicating for 100 years, 200 years, a few thousand years. It's a big uncertainty. How long can intelligent life survive without killing itself? It's a difficult question to answer, which I, I hope we can get to at some point. So let's just put some, some like best case numbers that we might have out there. Let's say that there are 100 billion stars in the Milky Way. There are a few more than this, but we're just rounding. And say that every one of those stars has a planet that can support life 
that does support life, that creates intelligent life, that starts sending signals out there. And let's be really optimistic and say that that life is around for 100 million years. In a galaxy, that's about a billion years old. Uh, 10 billion years old, I'm sorry. And if we plug all those numbers in, we get about 10 to the 9. That's a billion other intelligent systems that are out there, just like us. Most, about the most optimistic case that we can come up with gives us a billion other us's that are out there. But we have 100 billion stars in the Milky Way. That, the most optimistic estimate, puts us at one out of every 100 stars. Okay? Our radio communications have only made it out to about 100 stars. So we've kind of filled our bubble, and now we have to start getting to the next 200 stars before maybe someone might hear us. And hope that by the time they hear us, translate it, figure it out, send us something back, we're still here to hear it. <laughs> and then to translate what they said, figure it out, and send something back to them. Because radio waves travel slow. They only travel at the speed of light. And our galaxy is 100,000 light years large. If we were to take some realistic numbers and put them in here, this actually drops significantly. Anywhere down from 10 to the 4, so 10,000, to maybe 100,000, maybe, maybe 10 million, depending on how optimistic we are with our figures. And getting to this number entails nailing down these, which is why we have things like the Kepler satellite out there that's staring constantly at stars, looking for other planets, trying to figure out how many of those stars have planets. And then we can get bigger and better telescopes, ideally, hopefully, things like the James Webb Space Telescope, that's going to narrow down how many of those planets are actually able to support life. These, uh, it's going to take us a long time before we can narrow any of those down. Unless we really make some big strides on Mars, Europa, and Titan. So life is tough, diverse, and ubiquitous, at least here on Earth. It's probably the only place that we've got, at least within our grasp. But it's important, I think, that we just keep, in, keep exploring, both outside and inside of our galaxy, just in case there might be something out there. Because who knows, maybe, just maybe, right now, we're at the crux of our own little humanocentric revolution. And with that, I'll take some questions. You hear about all the people who say they've seen spaceships and things like that. If that were at all possible, like where would they be coming from? <laughs> <laughs> if that were at all possible, where would they be coming from? Well, it depends on their environments, right? Because if they're okay with water and not like the aliens from Signs who come to a planet that's 80% water and have a problem with actually water around, um, it, we, you have to worry about the kinds of stars, and that's where the complication of the Drake equation comes in. Because certain stars tend to live for a certain amount of time. The biggest and the brightest, the most massive stars out there only live for a few tens of, tens of millions of years. So in a few tens of millions of years, you're not likely to have a planet that can evolve life. Stars like our sun will probably live for about 10 billion years, and clearly that's enough time for life to evolve. But there are other stars that are smaller than our sun um, that have uh, masses half, quarter of the size of our sun, and those stars will live for 100 billion years, longer than the universe has been around so far. And those are, the planet, those are the stars that if we could find planets around them, and we found many planets around those kinds of stars, that's actually the first place we looked because it was easier to find planets around those stars. But if we can find planets like that in what we call the habitable zone, where there is some sort of liquid on the surface of that planet, which is, could be the subject of a whole other talk, if we were to find something like that, 
that would be a planet that allows long-term sustainability of life. Because the, the star itself isn't going to go supernova anytime soon. It's not going to envelop that planet, and it's not going to destroy it. We won't be here in less than five billion years, no matter what. We're probably looking at about a billion years from now, the sun will expand slightly and get so hot that liquid water will no longer exist on Earth. So make sure your investments are capped off before a billion years. Don't go for the really, really long-term investments. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's greedy, exactly. <laughs> So, so, if we were to look at something that was a, a civilization that might come on a planet that was around for 100 billion years, that you might have a civilization that had a billion years to not kill itself, that would probably be a place that can actually send some people off into the furthest reaches of space and, and maybe get to the point where they can unify gravity and all the other forces to something that we might be able to uh, manipulate to get the warp drive of Star Trek. We're still waiting for flying cars, so I'm not sure that warp drive is anywhere in the near future, so thank you. In the first image you showed us uh, from the Hubble mm -hmm. telescope, I noticed that, that there are black edges. Is that meant to reflect reality? No, um, oh. that's, a, that's a good question. Um, let me see, somewhere around here. That image. Uh, no, the, the black edges are simply the size of the photograph. Um, this is as big as their camera was able to take. Uh, the idea is that if you look anywhere in space, you're very likely to see exactly the same picture in just about every direction that you look. The problem is, um, and one of the reasons that it took us from Newton to Hubble to really understand our position in the universe, is it turns out there's a lot of stuff in the way. Well, we think of the universe as empty and completely nothingness that's out there. If you take one atom and put it, you know, every centimeter, every meter, by the time you're looking from one galaxy to another galaxy to another galaxy to another galaxy, all of those atoms add up and they actually block your view. This is that one small window of space where we have very, very few uh, of that mass in the way between our line of sight and the edge of the universe. So theoretically, everywhere we look, we, should, we would expect to see this. But the problem is space, as though it, even though it might seem empty, oftentimes makes a better door than a window. Um, do you think that uh, prions are a form of life or can be considered to be a form of life? I, I, I'm actually not familiar with a prion. Prions are uh, responsible for... Prions are responsible for uh, things like mad cow disease and things like that. Uh. They're, they're proteins that can essentially turn, uh, can mis that are misshapen proteins that then can re replicate themselves. Uh, and w with that question, I'm going to apologize to the biologists that might be in the room just for, for questions like that. Because uh, as, as much as I put the biology in the talk because it's relevant to it, it's certainly not my area of specialty. So things like that, um, from, from what I've been looking into in this, I would say that those are similarly thought of as, as this self-replicating organic molecules that, that kind of can affect and interfere with life. But it's a really tough question. I mean, personally, I would say that that falls under the same realm as viruses. And if you were to classify a virus as, as life, then you would. And there are people that do. There, like, I don't mean to say that, that the dividing line that, that I've kind of vaguely put up here is the dividing line. There's actually a debate as to whether or not viruses our life, and I would say that those fall into a similar debate, and, and I certainly don't have the expertise to give an answer yes or no to that. This is not a question, but it's just what I was reminded of as you talked, which is a poem by W.H. Auden, looking up at the stars I know damn well that for all they care, I can go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> but 
On <laughs> earth, indifference is the least we have to fear from man or beast. How would you like it were stars to burn with a passion for you you could not return? <laughs> if equal affection cannot be, let the more loving one be me. That's <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> This one right behind no. Last night I heard a comment from a youngster at a, a science school where, near where the, the shuttle is going to be positioned in California. And I would guess maybe he was eight or nine. And he was saying, you know, they asked him what they thought about the fact that there were no more shuttles. And he says, you know, maybe people won't care about space anymore. Your comments, please. Uh, that's a great question. I love space. Uh, and actually, just earlier today, I got a text from a friend of mine in California that said, I just watched the Space Shuttle Endeavor fly over the Golden Gate Bridge. And I was jealous. Um, I've, I've seen the Enterprise in the, at the um, Udvar Hazy Smithsonian Museum. And I will personally say that the reason that I love this stuff is because of the space program. It's because of that reaching for the stars. That was there. And when I was growing up, that was all of the rage. And that's why I got into science. And that's why I love ast astrophysics and, and this part of science. Um, if it weren't there, would I? I don't know. But I am, am very much a strong proponent of the idea of wonder and expansion that studies of outer space bring to the human mind. It forces us to think outside of the box. Because no matter how big of a box we want to make, the universe is bigger. And we have to think outside of it. And no matter what we imagine that could be out there, the universe is so big, it might just be out there. So I think it's really important to, to expose everyone to, to this idea of wonderment and awe and fascination that's out there. Because I think it's, it's really uh, shows the, that benefit to the human spirit and to the human condition that allows us to spend money on something that doesn't necessarily just give us some physical pleasure. It is the opposite of that greed in a lot of ways, I think. How, how much longer will Hubble last? Uh, is there a replacement for Hubble? Great question. Um, how much longer will Hubble last? Not more than a few years. Sadly, um, and, and we're really, really lucky to have it last, have lasted as long as we are. And I'm certainly going to be sad, but I will celebrate Hubble every day of my life. And I will celebrate the people that finally made the decision to do that one last servicing mission to keep it going for longer. It's got new batteries, it's got fresh solar cells, it's got fresh gyroscopes, which means it's good to go for a while. Um, I can't give you a number, but I would estimate at least a year or two, a couple of years. But we're not talking 10, most likely. The Hubble's not going to have the, the uh, longevity that the Spirit and Opportunity rovers have had that went orders of magnitude beyond their originally planned lifetime. We can hope that for the Curiosity rover, but we, can't, but we shouldn't expect it out of things. Um, and as for a replacement to Hubble, at the moment, no. Um, there's nothing planned. There's the JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope, which is the purported uh, replacement for Hubble. The most recent state of that, if I remember correctly, it was supposed to be launched in 2020, but budget cut after budget cut after recommendations that this, no lo that this project no longer be funded. It's one of those things that's kind of ambiguous and tenuous. It's recently gotten the, the go-ahead from Congress to say, OK, yes, you can now fund, and the JWST is a continued project. But there are recent budget reports that um, were saying even more astronomy facilities, such as the Green Bank uh, Observatory, is recommended to be closed just because of budget and fiscal constraints. And who knows what any upcoming larger budget cuts possibly proposed for January might cause um, devastating effects on things like pure science research on something like this. It, it's expensive, uh, and, and, I, and I, I unfortunately take no apologies, for, or make no apologies for that, um, because it gives us pictures like this. And it really opens our minds to something new that we wouldn't be able to get otherwise.
How near is the closest black hole, and how worried should we be? <laughs> <laughs> how near? Well, OK, I'll, I'll answer the last question first, because that's the easy one, and not. Um, so we shouldn't be worried about that. The closest black hole, depending on your physical theories, might be right all around us because there may be microscopic black holes. But we certainly, they haven't killed us yet, so they're probably not going to kill us. Um, the, the closest one, it's tough to tell. Um, there are a lot of what we call X-ray binary systems, which uh, is really the only way that we can see a black hole. And, and what that is is a black hole and another star next to it that's so close that the black hole is literally cannibalizing this other star. It's sucking matter off of it, and that matter is falling into the center of the black hole. As that happens, that ha matter that's falling in gets really, really, really hot and tends to give off lots and lots of really bright energy, x-rays particularly. So we get to see these x-rays from these, these black holes. So we're not seeing the black hole. Black holes we can't actually really see. But what we see is the effects of this matter falling into them. There are plenty of these that we know of. I couldn't tell you the, the distance of them, but there are certainly none that are in our backyard. So there's none that probably within a million years or even probably a billion years would ever really phase us too much. So argument for long-term investments. <laughs> <laughs> talked about the life of the planet. Will global warming have anything to do with the end of it? Absolutely, it can. <laughs> um, global warming probably won't end life on this planet, though. It probably will end our life on this planet. But there's a difference when you're looking cosmologically about whether or not one little species on the surface of one planet will survive. Looking at the rest of the bacteria, archaea, everything else that's, in, that's on the planet, Global warming is probably not going to kill everything. It'll probably kill us, but it won't kill everything. So it depends on what you mean by life. Uh, <laughs> so if you mean us, then yeah, it's something that we need to be worried about because we need to protect our own environments. And, and we have the ability to create and destroy those kind of environments. So it's important to, to spend some energies uh, on that if we want to actually continue um, doing the work that we're doing. you use the word edge of the universe? <laughs> yes, you did. Can <laughs> you explain that? Because I, my understanding, there really is. No edge. Yes. Um, it's a, you're, you're right to ask that question, and it's kind of a, a, a tricky point. When I say edge, I mean the furthest point that we can see. That doesn't necessarily mean the edge that we're going to run into and stop. It's the extent that we can actually see. And the, the reason that it gets fuzzy is because when you're looking at such large distances, we're talking 13.7 billion light years away, we're talking about seeing not only distance in space, but back in time. So we would never be able to get to that edge because as we got to that edge, time would evolve so it would no longer be the edge. So it's kind of running away from us at the exact same time as we might be running towards us. So there's no physical edge. There is only a theoretical and a conceptual edge, which is the instant at which the universe was created or came into being, as however you want to put it. Do you and your colleagues find the notion of an expanding universe Difficult to address? Uh, mathematically or Anyone philosophically? <laughs> uh, mathematically, an expanding universe is a term and an equation, and it's fine. It doesn't really mean anything. Uh, <laughs> it, it, like, so I, I say that because, I mean, the original Einstein's equation, um, we didn't have this entire idea of cosmology. So when Einstein wrote his uh, cosmo cosmological equation that kind of described what and how the universe ex was, uh, we didn't know that the universe was expanding. So he, in what he called, a, 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 you know, his greatest mistake, a, a fair deal of hubris, said, the universe is, always was, and is exactly the same. So he put forth the steady state approximation to what the universe is. So he put in a term in, into his equation that says, okay, the universe is like this, it's neither expanding nor contracting. So 
he added that term into his equation. And then Hubble came around and showed, it, showed him otherwise that the universe was expanding. So he erased the term in the equation. And, and that's all it was. So do we have some philosophical or personal connection to the equations that we write down? And as scientists, it's really difficult to get beyond your pet equation. Um, but as real scientists, we need to. And it's important not to let personal perceptions and philosophy and emotion uh, overshadow what we might see as facts. Otherwise, we might be left with uh, a geocentric universe for 1,500 years. I think we've had the rich fare that we promised in the beginning. And I thank you all for being here and listening. I think that we, and asking lots of questions, we do have enormous capacities for both creation and destruction. And um, we know which side we're on, and we are going to keep plugging at it and learn, learn more, and do more to make this, this particular planet a better place. So we fill out your evaluations. Have a sip of something outside, and thank you again for coming.